and it's great that you can be joining us uh, over Zoom or over Facebook or YouTube uh, whenever is convenient for you. Uh, let's begin our time this morning by reflecting on the key verse we're going to look at today from James 3. And it says this, and it's quite sobering, no one can tame the tongue. Yeah, we're looking at the tongue today and how it is set on fire and sets on fire all kinds of things. So I'll be uh, reading James together. I'll be punctuating the readings today rather than having them all at once. So uh, various people will read at various times. And I'm going to lead us in prayer now. And it's the prayer set down for today. Almighty God, your Son, our Saviour Jesus, is the light of the world. So grant that your people, enlightened by your word and the sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, so that he may be known and worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth. And we pray in Jesus' name, him who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, Tom's going to read for us this morning, Tom Pollitt. Uh, if you've not met Tom, Tom and Des have, have just started. Tom started as a, an assistant minister, um, especially for youth and families and children. So, Tom, why don't you come on up? I'm just filling the gap while you're walking up here, even though you've got long legs and you'll make it quickly. See what I mean? Just filling in. <laughs> Hi friends, please turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror 
and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Thank you, Tom. Our first song today, uh, even though we can't sing out loud, uh, will help us to reflect on the one who gives all good gifts. So I trust that you'll be doing that as we... Uh, listen and enjoy this together. Is coming up. I'd just like to point out something that struck me about James during the week. Come on up, Russ. It's good. 
how practical James is, but also how anti-individualistic he is. Listen as we read James 2 together and see how much of what James has to say is about the way that we treat one another as the people of God. And my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must show not favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that, it, his, that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and, was, and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent, off the, sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. <clears throat> Each week as we gather together, we proclaim in our local community the, the truth that we've sided with Jesus. We've 
put all our eggs in his basket. We've bet all we've got on him. We trust him. But of course, there are people around the world who do this and through time. And as we gather together, it's important for us to keep remembering that it's what God's doing is bigger than just us here. And as we say the Apostles' Creed together, we affirm the faith once for all delivered to the saints. This is the Christian faith. Let's say this together. And in fact, why don't we stand as we do this? It's a welcome relief, isn't it? We just need the next screen. <laughs> Thanks. I believe in God. Lorraine is going to read James 3 for us. And this is maybe actually the centre of the book, not just in terms of space, but in what the wisdom that James is teaching is about. And it's what we're looking at today after our readings. Thanks, Lorraine. Okay. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. We'll take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a rest, restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring?
whole world in his hands. Ready, mummies first. He's got all of the mummies. Mummies go, yay! In his hands, he's got all of the daddies. Yay! In his hands, he's got all of the children. Ready? Yay! In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got all of the grandmas. Yay! In his hands, he's got all of the grandpas. <laughs> what? What? Uh, is it still on? In his hands, he's got ready babies. Go goo. He's got all of the babies. Goo. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He does, you know, God has the whole world in his hands and God has a good plan. And his good plan is to bring all things together under his son, Jesus. And there's a verse from the Bible about that too. I'll put my little bookmark in here so I will find my spot. It's in the book of Colossians. And it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to bring all things together, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood on the cross. What a good plan to set all things right under Jesus. In fact, I changed the first song a little, and this is how it goes. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true, Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, for Jesus is mighty to save. Ready? It's going to be loud. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's true. It is true. You know what we should do? I'm going to pray now. Will you pray with me? Prayer is talking to God, by the way. All right, I'm going to close my eyes so I can think about talking to God. My Lord and my God, you are so big. You made the world and you take care of the world and you take care of everyone and everything in the world. And you have a plan, even though we don't always know it or see it. But we know that you've told us you will bring all things together under Jesus, that you will bring life to all who trust in him. So be with us, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> as, Kathy come, as Kathy comes up to read, I think we might have a loose connection. Hang on. Just want to turn it, just mute it for a minute. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. As Kathy comes up to read, one of the things that you might notice about James is James is very confronting. And the question is, how do we bear up under such, such confrontational language? And I think chapter 4, verse 6, is the key. But he gives us more grace. Kathy, why don't you come and read? James 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. Just mute the audio again. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. 
You do not have because you don't ask God. When you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity towards God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture said God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year, carry on business, make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Before Nick comes up to give us our final chapter of James today, uh, I've just got a couple of things to say. Uh, uh, Bible study this afternoon at five o'clock. Um, it's our way of doing church. We'll be meeting out in the back hall and talking some more about James 2 and everybody's welcome to come along to that. Uh, and the other thing is that the uh, church camp is on. Um, please, uh, please still consider coming to that and there'll be some more information about that um, as we get closer to the time. Thanks, Nick. And now James 5. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we counted as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. 
All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If you have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray now as we reflect on what you say to us, give us a right sense that it's you speaking to us, not just somebody else. Um, Give me the ability, please, to say what's true, that we might hear your word clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. There's copies of, uh, printed copies of what I'm going to say, or close to what I'm going to say, out available in the foyer as well. Um, I hope you've been appreciating James as we start off this year. It's so practical, and in particular this chapter I think is practical because it it gets to something that each one of us struggles with, and that's the use of the tongue. Chapters 3 and 4 actually are are both about this kind of experience. And in fact, it's there in chapter 1 as well. In the end of chapter 1, James is saying it's basically a complete sham if we say that we follow Jesus, but we don't follow through with mercy and care for those who cannot give to us and if we haven't got control of our tongue. James isn't talking about being well-spoken or having the right kind of accent or even what we do in an individual sense but our speech in the Christian community. Because nothing corrodes Christian community faster than sins of the tongue. Bickering and gossip and undermining and verbal attacks. Any of us can do immeasurable harm without even thinking about it, with no effort whatsoever. And I'm conscious, I am conscious as we go through James, that... uh, It's very easy for me or for us to make each other feel guilty. And that's that's not my aim. So look at verse 8 again. No human being can tame the tongue. It's very stark, isn't it? It's just, it's not possible. And at the same time, it's very depressing when you go to your Christian bookshop or a blog site or and see all it's written to tame the tongue. 30 days to tame the tongue. That's all it takes. Or even better, 30 days to tame your kid's tongue. It's wonder they don't have wives and husbands, but anyway. Or, or zip it, the 40-day challenge. Any advance on 40? Or this one, tame the tongue in 15 steps with pictures. And, and they're full of rules. These approaches, rules to tame the tongue. And now look, some rules are good. You know the five second rule, when you're in an argument with somebody, wait five seconds before you speak. It'll keep you from getting into more trouble. But no rule will fix us. We've conquered all kinds of things, the human race. Extraordinary what we've done. But before our own tongues, we remain shockingly defeated. That is what James is saying. And at the very same time, and here's the tension, James calls us to be like God in our speaking. This is the wisdom from above, verse 17 and 18. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. We shouldn't be opinionated and putting our own views forward is incontestable, but we ought to be humble and submissive to each other, 
We shouldn't be divided or insincere. We should mean what we say and say what we mean. And to be honest, I think that's the reverse of how we usually think. Because how we usually think is, I should be free to express, express whatever I want to. And James has been saying, not. Wisdom from above is not you doing whatever you want to do or saying whatever's inside you but humbly accepting the word planted in you, reckoning it joy when we face trials. And so our first reaction to today's passage ought to be, Lord, help us. James, I think, in, in the first bit of chapter 3, is, is kind of like a spiritual doctor. He's saying, poke out your tongues. Ah... And he diagnoses the Christian community. So I think there's two, two points I want to make really today. Firstly, just in verses 1 to 4, the spiritual power of the tongue for good. And in verses 5 to 16 or so, the spiritual power of the tongue for evil. So let's, let's just quickly just think about together, what is the spiritual power of the tongue for good in verses 1 to 4? James starts with himself. Now, many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. There's not some kind of elitism, as if uh, Christian teachers are somehow better than others. No. In fact, it's saying Christian teachers are exactly the same as everybody else, prone to failure. But because they're teaching, their failures are going to have an effect on more people. He's not speaking to the community in general, but to believers. He's not saying we should restrict the number of people going into ministry. Or there's some different kind of standard of judgment for teachers against other Christians. It's, it's got to do with the number of words and the influence over others. It is so easy to utter meaningless words and unkind words, thoughtless words, mean words. And, and James, I think, just shows us that he's not writing from the position of some kind of armchair theologian, but he's aware of the effect of what he's having on the, on the, on the people that he's writing to. In verse 2, he opens this out. He says, we all stumble in many ways. And isn't that true? And because of that, I, I hope you pray for each other and you pray for the teachers here. Because we're men who need forgiveness. Because we sin. In many ways. And then he turns to look to see what it looks like when the tongue is used for good. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And at this point, we need to slow down a bit because I think James is saying something that's actually completely different to what we think. See, we think the tongue is one area of our lives. And not even the most important area. I would be surprised. In fact, I've never really heard a, heard a talk in church um, if, on this, if any of us think that um, a major area of sin in our life was the way we speak or use our, lo our tongues or post online. It, it's, it's one area that is what we think. But do you see that James is saying that the tongue is the key to all the other things in life. Have, have a look at the passage again. See, he, he's not moralising, he's not giving us rules, he's not just saying, say nice things and don't say nasty things. He's saying the control of the tongue leads to the control of the rest of your life. Do you see that? God's control of our tongue is the means by which God gains control over the rest of our lives. And I don't think we think that. It's profound, actually, this, this thing that James is saying. And I think it's a bit hidden from us. So the tongue is not just a display of our spiritual health, but through our tongues we learn spiritual maturity. It's a unique gift of God that's key to our spiritual life. And that's why he uses these examples of horses and ships. I mean, how can a 40-kilogram teenager control a 500-kilogram horse? During the week, I was able to see some very big horses and uh, 
I know they were very big, I won't tell you why, but Dennis knows why, they're, why we know they're so big. Um, uh, or a ship at sea, in a heaving sea. How can the pilot keep the ship on course and headed to its destination? Very little bit of hardware, the rudder. And James' point is not just the size difference between the tongue and the body, but that horse and ship are both guided by the tiny rudder or the bit. Do you see that? Right? They're controlled by the tongue, is what he's saying. It's not that if you're powerful enough to control your tongue, you can control the rest of yourself. It's that our course and destination are set by our very tongues. That is the master battle that we must win. And it's why James spends so much time in James on the tongue. And, and just thinking a bit more, I think it's because the God he knows, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the speaking God. The one who spoke everything into existence with a word. Word is pivotal to true relationship and true being. You know, of all the creatures that God made, there's only one that he made in his image. Humans uniquely are God's speech partners. And it's our words, in our words, that we image God. It's not that animals can't communicate. Clearly they can. But our speech is qualitatively different and sets us apart from the animals. God spoke about all the animals, but he spoke to humans. And you can see the spiritual power for good that God's given in his words. Of course, most of us have had words spoken to us, words of hope and encouragement and help that have helped us to hang in there. When I was leaving a country town and moving to the big smoke to study and work, my dad pulled me aside and spoke to me. And I can still remember that conversation. We set the direction of our lives with our words. But in verse 5, James flips it around. Verse 5 reads, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. And you get the idea that maybe this little thing is too big for us, like a kid is sent down to buy some milk with a Formula One car. <laughs> or is given for his birthday a nuclear chemistry set. <laughs> So this massive power for good that God's given us can also be used for evil. And I have to say these things, because James does. It's for our good. Our tongues have got the capacity to spread from you to others, like a wildfire. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, we've all just experienced perhaps first-hand, perhaps second-hand, at least breathing in the smoke, the devastation of fires that can't be stopped. This time last year, we, we might have been wearing masks, but for a different reason to what we're doing it today. And it's the same with the tongue. When the fire's lit, you cannot undo what it's done. Long after the word's spoken, it keeps burning. Whatever is in its path, ecosystems of relationships... And every single one of us has said terrible things through our words and in our hearts and our emails and posts. And In fact, we've been far more destructive in our words than most of us could ever be in our fists. Maybe not John. Because our tongues are a fire. As you can see, I'm afraid of John. Our tongues are like a world of unrighteousness. And we might be serving God in 17 other areas of life, but the, our tongues, the way we use our tongues, stain us, and we don't have the power to remove that. And then James says, when we take this great gift of God and use it in this way, it's actually Satan himself who's at work in us. Our tongues are cosmically connected, do you see? With God in heaven and Satan in hell. See, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve fell away from relationship with God, the first sin 
was a sin of the tongue, wasn't it? It was a lie. Did God really say? And then when God called them to account, Adam blame shifted in two directions at once. That woman that you put here with me, not me. And remember with the prophet Isaiah when he went into the temple and he saw that in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the real king. He had a vision of the great and glorious God. He actually just saw the hem of his robe in the temple. Remember his first words on seeing the vision? Woe, woe is me because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and now I've seen God. And when the Apostle Paul wants to summarise the human condition, the climax of his summary is their talk that stinks. Their throats are like the place where you put dead bodies. Their tongues practice deceit. Snake poisons on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And I, and I, think, I think the devil uses the tongue more than anything. He tears down. He tears down friendships and families. Marriages, children, churches, nations, harmony. And the fact, frankly, the fact is if you've got a sharp tongue, you will push people away and end up living a lonely life. And even more devasta devastating, that's not even in our worst moments. So even when we think we have the best of intentions, our tongues have the power to destroy and tear down. Remember Apostle Peter, Mark chapter 8, Jesus has uh, shown who he is and now he says to them, this is me. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected, beaten, killed and rise again. And Peter, right, he's being utterly sincere. And what does he do? He pulls Jesus aside and says, that's not what happens to the Messiah. And Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan! You don't have in mind the things of God, but merely human concerns. See, no human can tame the tongue. We do completely contradictory things with our tongue. And we might sing God's praises and bless God and then get in the car and on the way home rip into that person who, look what they're doing, criticise and gaslight others. And I hope you're shocked. Because James is. Verse 10, my brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. In a Christian community, it shouldn't be like this. So he's talking to believers. And just to tighten the screws, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. See, this is not a problem for out there, is it? It's something for us. And so I just want to come back to verse 8 again. Remember verse 8? No human being can tame the tongue. James doesn't say there's no power that can tame the tongue. But you can't do it. And I can't do it. It's not that the tongue is untamable, but it's beyond you and it's beyond me. It's only God who can. And this is James speaking, who grew up with the Son of God, who committed no sin, no deceit, no doublespeak as a, as a boy. Just think about this if you've got a brother. He never sinned in what he said or did. Growing up with my brothers, my parents couldn't stop us fighting. He never said anything unkind or unclean or unnecessary. Nobody spoke like this man, Jesus. He is the wisdom from above. And in his death, he bore the mocking so we might receive blessing and honour from God and be God's blessing to others. 
So the Christian way with the tongue is not to get out the rule books or the 30 or 40 steps. It's indirect. Because the fundamental issue is not you having more control, but you giving yourself to God. So speech matters. In chapter 4, verse 6, James will write, he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So there's not ten rules to tame the tongue. It's indirect. It's as we submit ourselves to God. He will draw near to us. Draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. He'll forgive us and renew us and set us right and keep us through temptation and set us right again and purify us and use us for good. To he is the only source of change and transformation. So draw near to him. And though we fail, his grace is stronger. So turn away from hateful speech and turn to him. He quench the evil fire and set us on fire in a different way. Remember Pentecost? Fire that issued in a new speech that honoured God and through which people came into God's family. See, what James is writing about here is not just about you. The stakes couldn't be higher. Amen. I think Phil's going to come and lead us in prayer. Thanks, Tim. Morning, everyone. Do you ever find yourself feeling overwhelmed? It's interesting that Tim was talking about the tongue and about words. I think few people who know me would say I was a man of few words. But as I was contemplating what to pray for, I felt overwhelmed. Not overwhelmed by the, the issues, but overwhelmed by the number of issues to pray for. And I find often when you feel overwhelmed like that, I thought, I can't pray for everything. It's to go back to basics, to keep it simple. And so I went to the prayer book and I'd ask you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. God of everlasting love, who provides all things, we pray for all people. Make your way known to them your saving power among all nations. We pray for the welfare of your church here on earth. Guide and govern it by your spirit so that all who call themselves Christians may be led in the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. This morning we commend to your fatherly goodness all who are afflicted or distressed in body, in mind, or in circumstances. And we pray in a moment of silence those who are on our hearts this morning. Relieve them according to their needs. Give them patience in their sufferings and deliverance from their afflictions. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen.
people as we go out this morning, can I encourage you, it's a beautiful day uh, to talk outside and to go maybe deep with a few rather than trying to catch up with everyone. But let me leave you with these words from James 4. God opposes the proud and shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. See you next week.